Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pavel Ptaschek. I present Team Poland, and today I'll present to you our solution to problem number six, magnetic mechanical oscillator. The problem content states, uh, secure the lower ends of two identical leaf springs to a non-magnetic base and attach magnets to the upper ends such that they repel uh, and are free to move. Investigate how the movement of the springs depends on the relevant parameters. So now first we have the leaf springs, which cause oscillation in the system, and we model it using the euler bernoulli equation. Uh, we also have the magnets, which cause coupling in the system, and we model it using the dipole approximation. Uh, gravity also could have an effect on uh, torques and uh, forces in the system. However, uh, we eliminated this by placing our system horizontally. And here we see uh, a sample motion. So uh, let's take uh, the first part of our setup, which is the spring and the magnet. So uh, we uh, model our, our beam using the other Bernoulli equation, and uh, for uh, and we uh, then use uh, the core boundary conditions describing uh, its state. So uh, for the free beam, the free cantilever, uh, we uh, the first boundary condition describes that the lower end is uh, fixed. The second one states that it's straight. The third one states that there is no curvature on the free end, and the fourth one states that there is no shear force on the free end. And uh, then by applying the boundary conditions to the other Bernoulli equation, we get the vibration eigen modes. Now you can see that this equation predicts uh, several uh, higher modes of oscillation, and we can actually uh, see them. Uh, so we can we we were able to see uh, induced uh, first and uh, second modes, and uh, we can see them uh, both visually uh, by the shape of the beam, and and uh, we can see them on the spectrum. So uh, now we take the next step. So we add a mass on the end. Uh, and this, uh, uh, we we once again apply the boundary conditions, but our core boundary condition changes because we have an extra inertia term. Uh, and now when we apply the change boundary conditions, we get uh, the new vibration eigenmodes. And in this equation, we have a crucial dimensions, dimensionless parameter, which is the mass ratio. Uh, so uh, the ratio uh, between the mass of the uh, end of the beam and the uh, mass uh, of the beam itself. So uh, we can see how this important damage to this number uh, changes the, the shape of uh, several different modes of oscillation. Uh, so once we have uh, the string and the magnet done, uh, we can investigate uh, the magnetic interactions. So we model our magnets as magnetic dipoles, and we use the following field equations to describe the field in any point in space around the magnet. So once we have that, uh, we can also uh, find the force acting uh, between the magnets and uh, assuming that uh, uh, the magnets are parallel and uh, the motion is in, in, in the same axis, we get the following formula for uh, the force between the magnets depending on, depending on the distance between them. So an important parameter in this problem is the equilibrium point, and we find it by taking the magnetic force and the elastic force and finding the uh, equilibrium. So uh, we finally get an, a, a quintic equation uh, describing its position. And when we solve it, we use it as the center of linearization of the magnetic force. And we can uh, see this more clearly uh, here, where we, can, where we have the uh, a force between the dipoles. And then when we find the equilibrium point, we linearize it. And then uh, for the amplitudes of oscillation in our experiments, uh, we can see that this linearization works very well. So now once we have the magnetic terms done, uh, we can find the uh, dynamics of a coupled system. So uh, the, uh, to, to find the motion of the coupled system, I will have to uh, once again apply the boundary conditions, uh, but the fourth, uh, boundary condition will have a coupling term depending on the magnetic interactions. And uh, to find it, we have to find uh, the equations of motion of the free end. And we know that the system has two degrees of freedom. So we write out the equations of motion of the ends and we take into account the inertia, the shear force, and uh, the magnetic force. And uh, then by taking the sum and the difference of things from this equation, we get the coupling term, which is proportional to the uh, linear, linearized uh, magnetization. So uh, uh, now we can apply uh, this linearized magnetization coefficient to uh, this fourth boundary condition, and we get our final vibration eigenmodes in the system. And so now we're able to predict any uh, frequencies. So when we plot the first four, uh, we can see that uh, the higher modes uh, have uh, uh, much higher frequency, uh, which also means that they decay faster. So the most important part of the frequencies in our problem will be, will be the first two. 
so uh, now the, the, the first one corresponds to uh, oscillations in phase. The second one describes oscillation in antiphase. And then the final solution uh, is a superposition of these two modes. So now if we want to predict all these frequencies, we have to find an important parameter, which is the bending stiffness. And we do this by measuring the force uh, acting by the rod for different uh, distances of the deflection. And we found this bending stiffness for all the beams that we use. So then we use this bending stiffness uh, uh, to uh, compare our theoretical predictions with the actual frequencies of vibration of the cantilever. You can see that we can predict them very well. Uh, same goes for or when we added the mass on the end, we can so, uh, we can see that we can actually predict uh, the frequencies of oscillation. Now, when we uh, want to predict the frequencies of, in uh, in a coupled system, uh, first we have to take care of uh, the mechanical uh, interactions, and to do that, we need the mechanical dipole moment, which we measure by first uh, measuring the field from different distances uh, from the by using the gauss meter with and without a uh, CPU attached. Uh, and we can see that the ones with the sodium attached have a, uh, a lot larger magnetic field uh, due to magnetiz magnetization inside the beam. Uh, so uh, when we uh, took this uh, magnetic field points, we fitted a magnetic dipole model uh, to find out the values of the magnetic dipole moment. But we can see that for a small distance from the magnet, uh, the, the, there's large discrepancy. And to fix this, we use the magnetized cylinder model and we use the following equations uh, describing the magnetic field in any point in space. Now, when we fit this uh, fixed model, we can finally see that even for uh, small distances from the magnet, uh, we are able to predict uh, the uh, value of the magnetic field very well. And now we use uh, the, the, the the fitted value of magnetization, magnetization for uh, later uh, theory purposes. So uh, we uh, then did to uh, check whether the value of this magnetization is right. Uh, we made an independent measurement by measuring the force between the magnets for different distances, uh, and uh, we found we can very accurately predict uh, this force depending on the distance between them. We uh, uh, then uh, we wanted to uh, measure uh, a later experience for frequencies of oscillation. We use the three different beams, uh, the steel beam, which is paramagnetic uh, and it can have any current. The aluminum beam uh, can have any current, but it's not paramagnetic. And the plastic beam has neither. And we attached all of them to the table base. We also used uh, different magnets with different magnetic dipole moments and different masses. And so here's a, a, a sample graph of the oscillations. Uh, and uh, we can see a clear uh, a beating uh, pattern, uh, which suggests that there might be two frequencies. And in fact, when we take the Fourier transform uh, of the motion, uh, we can actually see that there are these two frequencies, and we can we know them perfectly. Uh, when we look closer, we can also see that we have another important parameter, which is the amplitude. And we can see that the amplitude is decreasing the due to dissipation in the system. And so the main major uh, source of dissipation is the deformation of the beam, and we use the color of the model to describe it. And so we have a, a change uh, in the order of Bernoulli's equation. And then uh, we use this other Bernoulli equation to find the dynamics by using uh, uh, the separation of variables. And from it, we have the final solution of motion of, of this uh, beam uh, with, uh, with uh, the deformation dissipation. Uh, and uh, we have a crucial parameter which is the uh, decay rate. And so the system we describe how fast it would, the energy would be dissipated. Uh, and so we uh, fitted this uh, decay rate for uh, different uh, trajectories of oscillation. Uh, and we could uh, find this value for the beam series. And uh, we found that uh, just like our theory predicts, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the decay rate uh, is affected uh, by the frequency. So larger frequencies decay faster. And so uh, we use this uh, decay rate uh, to predict uh, the trajectories. And uh, we can see that we have good agreement between uh, the theory and experiments. So now let's move on back to the uh, frequencies. Uh, we can, uh, okay, so uh, we can uh, measure these uh, frequencies using uh, the Fourier transforms. But we can uh, also start from different initial conditions. And I can see that for both the first mode and the uh, second mode, uh, totally different modes are induced, but the, 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 the frequencies are the same. Uh, the only thing that initial conditions change is the distribution uh, of the amplitudes of different modes. 
So uh, this is the initial conditions that we use for experiments, and we can see clearly both modes. So in our experiments for frequency, we change the following parameters, uh, the magnetic dipole moment, the mass of the magnet, the linear density, the length of the beam, uh, the, ma uh, the, the material type, and the amplitude of oscillations. So we check the aluminum beams, and you can see that we can predict uh, those frequencies very well. We also uh, change the magnets, and uh, we can still actually predict both frequencies. We also change the uh, uh, the type of the beam, plastic beam, and we can uh, we predict this very well. But uh, now, when we want to make experiments for the magnetic dipole moment, we have to account for the fact that uh, larger magnets with larger magnetic dipole moments also have larger mass. So we adjusted that by adding mass to the magnets. Uh, and analogously, uh, for experiments for mass, we kept the magnet the same and just add the extra mass. So here we see that we can accurately predict. The frequencies of both frequencies of oscillation of, uh, uh, by changing the uh, uh, magnetic dipole moment. Uh, and also, uh, we can accurately predict the frequency of oscillation uh, when we change uh, the uh, mass on the end. We also check if there are any nonlinear effects by leaving a uh, large amplitude of oscillation. And we can see that uh, uh, we can still accurately predict the frequencies, which means that both the uh, euler bernoulli theory uh, and the linearization is appropriate for the realm of uh, uh, that we use. Uh, we, we also check how these frequencies depend on the mass ratio, and we you can see once again very good correspondence. We can predict uh, on the, our master curve predicts uh, all these frequencies very well. Uh, we, uh, we don't see a good correspondence for the steel beams, which is due to the fact that uh, the, the beam magnetizes, which causes uh, the, uh, the second mode uh, to not work for a large length of the beam. So in conclusion, we created a theoretical uh, model describing the frequencies of oscillation uh, for uh, using Euler, uh, Euler Bernoulli beam theory. Uh, we uh, found, uh, we, we used a deformation model uh, to, uh, and we found the uh, dissipation constant. We were able to uh, predict both the frequencies and the amplitudes uh, over time uh, for uh, every uh, possible scenario. And we found that uh, we measured the experiments and found that our theory predicts the results very accurately. Thank you.